first of all, a uh, general framework that most of you already know. <laughs> Cyprus was never bridged to the mainland. The maximum pleniglacial regression did not significantly reduce the distance to the continent. Whenever an islet actually existed in the way to Cyprus, the sea voyage should have been 42 plus 25 kilometers at the very minimum during the pleniglacial. At the very beginning of the Holocene, it should have been already 70 to 80 kilometers long and complicated by the surface oceanic current. At the end of the 80s, <clears throat> we just learned that Epipaleolithic people were frequenting episodically the island about 10,500. Uh, the Cypriot Neolithic was considered to have started late uh, around 7000 BC and to have generated markedly insular culture, the Kiroketia culture, and uh, furthermore, the Sotira culture of the Middle Neolithic with uh, pottery. The three millennia of the PPNA and PPNB, that are over there, um, were unknown in Cyprus. And the island was considered as a very peripheral region, the neolithization of which was a late epiphenomenon in the emergence of the Neolithic of the Near East. However, during the 90s and the 20th, the discovery of large villages related to a Cypriot form of the PPNB, especially at Chirocombos and Milustia, have deeply changed this conception. This moved the beginning of the of of the Cyprus Neolithic 15 centuries earlier back, uh, about 8,300, 8,500 BC. Excavations conducted during the, the last 10 years uh, at Trumbogunos, Timonas, and Aspokrenos uh, evidenced the presence of a Cypro PPNA and again pushed back the beginning of the Neolithic in uh, Cyprus at, uh, of at least seven centuries. In this conference, we will present the new archaeological information collected during the last 15 years about the history of the colonization of the Neolithic uh, and the Neolithic transition of the island, mostly uh, based on the site of Etokremnos, Aspokremnos, Chirocambos, and Timonas, with a special focus on the latter, which have been excavated recently. We will successively examine four chronological phases. Um, the, the Epipaleolithic, uh, the uh, Cypro PPNA, the early Cypro PPNB, and the middle and late Cypro PPNB. For the different steps of this long evolution, we will try to evidence the particular contributions of this island area to the understanding of the Neolithic transition process in Southwest, in Southwest Asia. Finally, we will devote a few minutes to our more recent discovery, which for the first time likely lifts the veil on the totally unknown Cypriot people of the 10th millennium. So first, let's move to the Epipaleolithic. Uh, I, I, of course, I will be very short and Alan should probably, uh, would probably tell much better than I am, a little bit uncomfortable with that. But uh, anyways, I just recall what I, I uh, what we consider about this uh, site of uh, Etochrenos. The, the small shelter of Etochrenos is the only undisputable epipaleolithic site in Cyprus. It's indeed the only one with associated fireplaces, flint tools, and food refuses. The fillings describe two steps, well separated by a sterile layer. The lower layer figures the endemic Cyprus fauna before the frequentation by humans with huge densities of pygmy hippos and elephants. The Bayesian processing of, of more than 30 dating allows to date this natural bone accumulation between 11,000 and 10,500 BC. This is, uh, there, there is no more unremoved hippo or elephant bone in the upper layer, suggesting that this endemic fauna got extinct about 10,500. This upper layer has been accumulated by human beings who frequented the shelter around 10,500 BC. 
The analytic tool set doesn't differ from the Anatolian epipaleolithic industry, that is some of them, except the absence of obsidian. The food refuses <coughs> were mainly composed, uh, the food refuses were mainly composed of shellfish and fish and bird bones. However, 17 small sized bones of ungulates revealed that these people recently introduced wild boar to Cyprus and hunted them. They likely introduced them for stocking the island in large game after the extinction of hippos and elephants. This is the earliest known evidence of control of ungulates in Southwest Asia, 2000 years before the earliest evidence of pig, cattle, goat, sheep management on the continent. This is the first original contribution of Cyprus to the understanding of the Neolithic process in Southwest Asia, at least the first in the chronological uh, succession. Let's move now to the, to the Cypro PPNA. <clears throat> um, the the Cypro PPNA <clears throat> is now documented by two principal sites, Asprochemnos and Klimonas. Together, they provided a very homogeneous set of about 60 radiocarbon dates. Uh, not all of them are published at that time. They are calibrated between 9,200 and 8,600 BC. This large interval is due to the multiple plateau of the calibration curve for this period. Chuck Manning proposed a Bayesian model which reduces this interval around the date 8,800 and we have also the same results, the conversion on the same date for the village of Klimanas, we will speak of it later on. This is the second original contribution of Cyprus to the understanding of the neolithic process in Southwest Asia. At least at its, at its late phases, the PPNA extended also to Cyprus beyond the sea. This indicates that sea voyages were unsuspectedly developed at that time. Was this Cypro PPNA very different from those of the continent? Aspo Krenos, discredited by Carol McCartney, provided nearly 10 round buildings, some of them being semi embedded. Carol McCartney convincingly interpreted this site as a non permanent settlement for the specialist, specialized exploitation of flint and ochres. Klimonas is located on a naturally terraced, gentle slope looking towards the sea, which is only two kilometers far from there. Our excavations between 2010 and 2016, um, sorry, uh, concerned about 1,000 square meters. <clears throat> they allow to estimate the preserved surface of the human occupation to half an hectare. The middle terrace seems to have been the center of the site with 10 meters big building and to the south, the peripheral curvilinear ditches of a series of very eroded smaller buildings. East and north, thick and well-preserved PPNA deposits were only partly excavated at that time. The big building was circular semi-embedded with a peripheral earth wall settled in a foundation ditch. It has been eroded in such a way that the south extremity here on the left was on the point to be destroyed. We found central and peripheral pole holes which, which suggest the presence of a light roof. The preservation of the PPN level of circulation besides the building allows estimating that the floor was one meter deep. This, the floor of the building, of course. This means that the PPNA people excavated 70 cube meters for embedding this building, which is a, a lot and necessitated probably a lot of people and a collective effort. The profile uh, uh, excavated in the fillings of the building revealed that the latter were, were composed of the rest of a series of at least four successive buildings, which were rebuilt the one on the other in the same initial 10 meter pit. The earliest building opened to the northeast by a three meter large entrance 
over there. The main pole hole is central. At the opposite of the entrance, the floor is slightly higher, forming a kind of amphitheater. To the north, there were 20 to 30 centimeters high earth benches also, which they are masked here by, by the, partly masked by the image. The peripheral poles were paired and regularly outfaced. Here they are, here also, here again. This is not connected with the building. This is only cultivation pit dating to the historical time. The earth wall were preserved in the north half of the peripheral trench. The floor was riddled with pole holes, offering pits and fireplaces that are um, spotted over there. We interpreted this as a communal building similar to the ones excavated in numerous PPNA sites on the continent, such as here at the image, Jeff El Armar, Tel Arb, or Wadi Seinam. This is the third original contribution of Cyprus to the understanding of the Neolithic process in Southwest Asia. Not only PPNA people settled to Cyprus, but they imported there the complex model of the earliest villages, of the communal building, and likely of the social organization that produced them. South to the communal building, the communal building is over there on this map, south to, to the communal building, this section of the excavation, section B, was excavated in 2015 and 2016. This is the last excavation that we processed in Cyprus, in, uh, in Simona. On about uh, 400 square meters, we discovered the floor, fireplace, and peripheral foundations ditches of at least 25 buildings overlapping the ones on the others. All of them are terraced on the slope. For example, here we see three successive buildings. You have the trenches of the three successive buildings where separated the ones from the other on the right of the picture. Um, they are set all on the same terrace with their three fireplaces, one two and three, which are not uh, emptied at that time of the excavation. Uh, and uh, for the later, uh, the later building, the, the cup mark, which is still in place beside the, the, the fireplace. <clears throat> the walls were built for all these buildings in earth with only some wooden poles for supporting the downslope parrot which is of course eroded for most of the building and on which we have very little information. The stone were not used for building, except for making steps for the entrance, as you see here for the entrance of this, of this building. For the building technique, the Cypro PPNA appears as an additional regional variant uh, of the, the PPNA. Uh, it fits the large range of the Southwest Asian PPNA diversity of models. Klimanas, and I will I will leave the talk to to Francois for the next slide. Sorry, I was I was going on Francois. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yes, uh, Klimanas uh, produced more than uh, three ton of flint. Uh, very. Uh, a very important quantity of uh, flint uh, found in the excavation. All of them uh, came from the local uh, Lefkara Chalks, uh, which leads which, uh, uh, at less than 15 minutes uh, walking to the site. The two natural kinds of flint uh, are uh, represented, uh, translucent and uh, opaque. We found uh, four obsidian blades or bladelets Bernard Gratus uh, analyzed uh, three of them and found uh, that they were coming from uh, Goludak, Goludak 5 source. These are the oldest uh, obsidian attestation indicating that C. Cyprus was connected to the networks of the Levant. Blood production appears to have been exclusively unidirectional and uh, aimed to produce small triangular blades with a rectilinear profile of four, five centimeters long. 
big blades give an idea of the size of the initial core. The second type of production is a bidirectional mode of core exploitation, but it was very rare. However, no predetermined or central blade is apparent. We find several hundreds of arrowheads which were extracted from the unidirectional debitage. They present a short triangular tongue and an, an opposite uh, extremity sharpened by bifacial oblique retouch. The blood technology and the arrowheads of Climonas could be related with the Muribetian of the Middle Euphrates Valley, more precisely the phase three of Muribet, Sher Hassan, and also in phase one of Jade. The lozenge types also find convergence with Upper Mesopotamia in an American context. Tools are dominated by burins uh, all, uh, of uh, all kinds, then by hand scrapers. The points with tongue show fractures, impact marks, and more discrete traces related to hunting activities. There are also many glossy blades that are related to harvesting activities. The macrolytic industry, the macrolytic industry are represented by over 830 tools. So far, 20 morphology types have been described with uh, over 30 different functions. Hammerstone, groved Hammerstone, cup mark, anvil, cairns, and stone, slate of limestone, which are in some case covered of ochre, and shaft straightener. Seashells were not part of the diet of the Pepeana villagers and were exclusively used for symbolic production and technical activities. The shells are mostly local and fossil. Hundreds of shells were perforated by percussion and show evidence of suspension. Perforated sweet teeth have been identified. Local soft green stones belonging for the serpentinid family were also used for the manufacture of beads and pendants. Blanks and finished products are present at the site. The stone beads are highly diversified and do not show any standardization. Despite uh, the, the next piece, uh, despite oh. the, the, the massively uh, use of uh, local uh, Cypriot uh, geological and mineral uh, resources, except for obsidian, all the different aspects of the material culture, either tools or symbolic objects, appear to be regional variants of their uh, continental PPNA counterpart. Was the economy also within the range of variation of the Southwest Asian continental PPNA? Seeds are poorly preserved, but we found some impressions of cereal in building earth hardened by fire, together with some chair seeds of Pistachia, Amygdalus, Barley, and Emma wheat. The latter is not native in Cyprus and has been introduced for, from the continent. Sickles, greenstone, cereal shafts, and spitalites in the building earth are additional evidence of cultivation of wild cereals. The formal remain refer to a very limited number of species. They are, however, very numerous, nearly 5,000 um, uh, identified specimens. The small wild boar, which is the, 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 most, the most abundant species, represented 95% of the identified specimens. It is the same endemic form 
as the one which has been described in a criteria I spoke before, and which is about 13 persons smaller as on the continent at the same time, and uh, which po possess also reduced locomotor capability. Uh, age at death and sex mortality, uh, age at death and, and sex mortality represent nine, um, indicate that these wild boars were hunted without no doubt. The domestic dog is also represented by some bones and by numerous gnawing marks on the sweet bone. Together with the endemic Cypriot mouse, we evidence the presence of a common soul mouse recently introduced from the continent. Cat is very rare, but already present. The rest of the formal remain refers to birds and freshwater turtle and crab. There is absolutely no, not any one remain of any marine animals, including fish and shellfish. They are really absent, completely absent from the site. The economic model perfectly fits, except this problem of absence of, of water resources, it perfectly fits the one of the continental PPNA. It is based on cereal cultivation uh, uh, of pre-domestic forms and storage of these cereal and on, on wild boar hunting. The differences consist in the poor vi var variety of resources and results from the insular context. Let's move now to the early cycle PPNB. The early site for PPMD is represented by the well 116 at Milusia and by the phase early A of the large settlements of Shirokombo. The latter provided private and carbon base, which are concentrated around 8,500 and 8,200 calibrated BC. At Shirokombo, the very early, the, the earliest phase, the early phase A, uh, Provided deposit composed of very eroded feature and of living layers. The buildings are only represented by fragments of plaster. The most remarkable feature are seven meter deep wells, which are the earliest known in the world. Similar wells here uh, on the bottom right uh, have been also found at Milusia and dated of the same period. One of these well provided the, the famous greenstone sculpture representing an anthropomorphic feline head. Pearl holes suggest the presence of small round buildings out of earth and protected by decorated coatings. A series of narrow ditches here, while visible, interrupted by 80 centimeters wide doors, suggest the presence of large enclosures. They can be interpreted either as protection of the cultivation against animals, or uh, like uh, it showed on this picture of this reconstitution, as enclosures uh, for um, uh, keeping uh, animals captive. Anyway, they suggest the beginning of animal breeding. The formal remain confirm this. In addition to the species already attested at Fibonacci, that is to say dog, uh, cat, mice, an overwhelming dominant wild boar on the, on the left, we found a small number of domestic goat and cattle bones. They were necessarily introduced from the continent very short after the first, their first domestication. This is a very strong evidence that husbandry actually started at the early PPMD on the continent. It is interest, interesting to notice that the early domestic goat was immediately released to the wild and hunted as a second game after the wild bull, of course. Um, the flint uh, came from the same local Lefkara Chalk uh, as for Climonas. The translucent chert was uh, preferentially uh, selected. 95 uh, obsidian bloodlets were coming from a uh, the Golidag, mostly from uh, Kormuchu Kaletepe. All the obsidian bladlets were knapped by pressure according to Kaletepe uh, uh, technological uh, model. But not uh, in Cyprus. Uh, the blanks uh, have been imported uh, ready for use in Cyprus. 
The main chain operator was focused on the production of long and rectilinear blades, starting from a naviform core by bidirectional technology. These blades were mostly used for making big arrowheads, the proximal extremity of which was chopped by inverse and parallel pressure retouch and by two notches. Is it on, on the next? Other, bla other blades were used unretouched for producing uh, longitudinal cycle blades. Here again, Cyprus present a regional variant of the bidirectional knapping, which is so emblematic of the Levantine PPNB. Let's move now to the mid and late type of PPNB, that is to say the duration of the AC millennium uh, BC. The early, early C, middle, and late phases of Shiro Kambo describe the evolution of the type of PPNB along the AC millennium in parallel to the middle and late PPNB on the continent. Here you have the representation of the uh, Bayesian boundary beginning and end of each of these different phases based on 39 radiocarbon days. They allow to precise the duration of each phase, which is very un uneven from one to the other. The first half of the eighth millennium, that is middle type of PPNB, is represented by small round buildings, very similar to the one of the early eighth phase. Six to seven meter deep wells were still excavated and used at that period. We also found the large collective burial with more than 16 individuals and 11 individuals, individual burials, more or less similar to the ones which have been found at Kyotikia uh, during the next millennium. In one of the individual burials, the human was associated with the earliest known domestic cat. This discovery together with the introduction of cats to Cyprus together with the pre-domestic agriculture and the coming from mouse uh, evidence at, uh, at Simona, evidence that cats had been domesticated somewhere in the Levant 5,000 years before Egypt. Back from the beginning, yes, from the beginning uh, to the end of the eighth millennium, we observe a drastic uh, reversal of the proportion of the translucent flint versus the flint opaque, opaque flint. The proportion of obsidian also decreased to a very low rate. It still came from the Guludag, but its origins partly shift from Kaletepe to Bitreclair in Kinlik. During the first, first half of the eighth millennium, we observed the continuation of the bidirectional knapping technology and the production of uh, rectilinear blades for making, uh, among others, bigger roads. However, the blades tend to become less regular and less carefully made. The longitudinal circle blades are replaced by crescent chapelle bucket blades exhibiting oblique gloss. During the, the second half of the eighth millennium, corresponding with the late Cipro PPNB and the seventh millennium Kirokitian culture, the bidirectional clapping decreased and the big blades technology progressively vanished. During the PPNB, local fossil shells are also used for the beads manufacture. Many specimens show evidence of their use. Large fossil spondylus are also used as small cup for steering soft material. Local soft green stone are also used for the manufacture of beads and panants. Blanks and finished products are present at the site. The beads are not standardized and show a higher diversity than during the PPNA with the introduction of large rings 
and pendants decorated of lattice pattern. A single exogenous red carnelian bead is notified at the end of the PPNB. Despite, the, despite the, the use of local raw material for the beads manufacture, Cypriot villagers preserved aesthetic standards commonly adopted on the continent. This is the case of the green stone, which are very common on the continent all along the PPN, the decrease of the tusk shells and uh, at the end of the PPN, which is also observed in the South Levant and the adoption of the red color at the end of the PPNB observed at the same period in the Euphrat region. Let's move to the four more remains. This table recapitulates the complex sequence of interactions between humans and animals during the cycle PPNB. Red, orange, and green refer respectively to wild, commensal, or domestic animal populations. During the middle cycle PPNB, three new species were introduced the Mesopotamian fallow deer, sheep, and a fox. The Mesopotamian fallow deer was released in the wild and hunted. The sheep was herded with two successive different lineages. And uh, the, the fox was probably tolerated in the village as commensal, uh, besides the, the cat. Domestic dogs in the same time and cattle will disappear from the site and they will be absent from Cyprus for the five following millennia. Mice are still abundant uh, and commensal, and cats progressively move from a statute of commensal to pet keeping or even domestication. The Cypriot wild boar, also in the same time, and the feral goat were locally domesticated during the middle and late PPMB, respectively. They gave birth to local domestication, domestic lineages, which were bred during the rest of the Neolithic and Cyprus, most probably. And this is interesting to, to, to notice that uh, the wild animal, the wild animals which were present on Cyprus were locally domesticated. And for the other species which have been uh, herded, uh, they have been introduced from the continent. Uh, this uh, this opposition is between wild boar and goats for, on one hand and cattle, sheep um, on the other hand. The evolution of the proportion of hunting versus animal breeding is far from being linear. Here, there is a, a very uh, important uh, interval of, uh, of uh, variation for each period because it's difficult to decide uh, actually, uh, what uh, uh, what was exactly the use of each population, either uh, uh, domestic or wild? But what we can uh, summarize of this evolution is as follows: wild boar hunting, with a small development of cattle and maybe pig and goat breeding during the early phase A. Strong development of farming during the early phase B with cattle, sheep, and pig breeding, but in parallel, strong development of deer hunting, deer has just been introduced at that time. Then we assist to an, an abrupt decrease of a husbandry as a transition between early and middle phase, which is a very big uh, uh, rupture, a very big uh, uh, accident in the history of the site for all the different. Um, Component of, uh, of the archaeological literature. Then we see a strong development of pig breeding during the middle phase A, but deer hunting remains remain important. And finally, strong development of sheep and goat herding with a return to wild boar hunting in a small proportion. Uh, at the end of this process, we estimate that the, the uh, husbandry brought 
uh, between 60 and 75 percent of the uh, animal uh, resources uh, in, into the diet. The large variability of the situation and the nonlinear trajectory can also be could also be suspected on the continent. If we look at this uh, diagram where Daniel Elmer and myself several, several years ago uh, juxtaposed several sites, uh, um, in the, the earliest one on the left and the most recent on, on the right. But because of its insularity, Cyprus provides a more refined scenario of the complexity of the beginning of animal husbandry during the 18th millennium at the local scale. scale. We learned a lot during the last 30 years about the unsuspected early Neolithic story of Cyprus during the 8th and 9th millennia. But we still know nothing about the 10th millennium between the Epipaleolithic occupation of Akrotiri and the village of Primona. Was there a long PPN story in Cyprus, or did the island stay apart from the first steps of the PPN? Our new project consists in looking after the 10th millennium occupation. The geomorphological in investigation that, that has been developed by Pantelisa Milona here on the picture during her PhD in the framework of the Primonas project made it clear that it is a very difficult task. Indeed, Pantelisa demonstrated that a very strong erosive phase started with the early warming policy of the Holocene which abruptly and strongly deepened the valley. This provoked a strong erosion of all the slopes and probably the destruction of all the putative archeological sites anterior to 9,200, the transition between the late Gato and the early Holocene. After these dates, the sites such as Crimonas, uh, here on the picture, uh, or Shirokambo, uh, who are admittedly very eroded, but they are still visible. This is why, in spite of our numerous prospections, we never found anything potential referring, potentially referring to the earlier uh, period. However, some small limestone plateau escaped this massive erosion. This is the case of the Armenokori plateau. We see this plateau uh, in the landscape here, it, it appears clearly discordant onto all the other geological layers on this map. This is this, this small uh, part, this small region. In addition, it is located very near Clivanas and Chirocambo, a few kilometers. This is why, starting in 2019, we concentrated our surveys on this plateau and finally on the, this small part of the plateau. The geomorphological study of Armenokori Plateau reveals small oblong grassy plains, as you see here. Here is Francois. Uh, grassy plains composed, uh, settled uh, on, on red clay coming from the alteration of the sur surrounding castified limestone. They appear to have resulted from the rapid filling of uh, pre Holocene valleys. This was a good confirmation that this place escaped the early Holocene erosion and could have preserved some pre-Holocene sites. We reconstructed the profile of these uh, of three of these small fossil valleys here in red. They are divergent, one here, one there, and another one here, and then and a fourth one over there. In our pedestrian survey, and now Francois will comment. Yes, uh, in uh, our uh, pedestrian uh, surveys, uh, we collected the numerous flints, uh, marking a clear difference from the industrial background, well characterized by the, the ninth and the eighth millennia. It's uh, constituted by a microlithic uh, industry made on bloodlets and uh, small tools, including uh, scrapers, burins, and uh, denticulates. Projectile points are missing, but uh, it will be necessary to wait for the excavation to determine if there, there, there are any and of what kind 
they were. Geophysical surveys of, of the, the most uh, promising locality, combining uh, electrical and uh, magnetic measurement, provide encouraging results. A higher magnetic susceptibility area shows a set of annular magnetic anomalies of one meter or two, three meters in size, and anthropogenic origin of these characteristics may therefore be suspected. The purpose of our presentation was to highlight how the discoveries of, of these last 30 years in Cyprus contributed to increase the knowledge and understanding of the development of the early Neolithic in Southeast Asia. It is time now, as a conclusion, to try to recapitulate the main lessons from Cyprus. First of all, Cyprus made us more careful with reference to the absence of evidence in archaeology, of course. 30 years ago, the Cypriot Neolithic began with a markedly original, original culture of Cephidia, about 6,800. We added two millennia of an unsuspectedly rich Cypriot prehistory before that day, and propose now a completely opposite interpretation pointing out the overwhelming similarities with the continent. And we are hopefully on the point to add something about the 10th millennium during the next month or year. Second, it appeared that the PPN culture developed overseas as well. This means that the sea could have played an unsuspected role in the emergence of the Neolithic in Southwest Asia. This also suggests that the settlement of islands, which is considered as part of the Neolithic package during its spread through the Mediterranean between the 7th and the 6th millennia, was already an important manifestation of the Neolithic expansion as soon as the very beginning. Three, many cultural traits in the technologies of building, of making stone tools, of making beads and pendants, convincingly pleased for the idea that Cyprus was not more divergent from the continental PPN model than any other Southwest Asian region. The organization and location of the villages, the emergence of cultivation, then of animal husbandry, also argue in favor of this vision. Cyprus increased the panel of the different regions where the PPN developed in Southwest Asia. It contributed to refine the list of the traits common to all the PPN regions or specific to re the regional variation. Four, it's also interesting to observe that the local insular condition, yet very unusual in this panel of sites of the PPN, did not significantly modify the expression and trajectory of the PPN development in Cyprus. This particular condition finally only impacted the nature of the lithic raw material for fruit and jewel, and the diversity of the cultivated plants and weird animals, which are drastically constrained by the incredibly low local biodiversity. People even artificially increased this biodiversity by introducing new plants and animals, taxa. Fine. In turn, this introduction illustrates for the first time so clearly the exchanges at the regional scale in within the, uh, P, the PPN area. This question of exchanges rested a kind of black box for us on the continent where the natural resources are more or less similar between the different uh, PPN regions. It's very difficult to trace the exchanges for that reason. The very specific natural geo and biodiversity of Cyprus allowed to identify the obsidian, of course, as a product of introduction, but also some domestic or moreover wild animals. Their transportation from one place to another was only suspected on the continent, never so clearly evident as a major component of the emergence of the Neolithic food supply system. Migration of people is also supported by Cyprus' better 
than any other region in Southwest Asia. Unfortunately, we need DNA information and we have no not because the, the DNA is not preserved in the bones of the PPN time inside. Six, insularity also brings the opportunity to disentangle the local innovation from the external input. It is, for example, interesting to observe that the male PPN people domesticated the local wild boar and fur goat, as I already emphasized before, rather than, in, than importing domestic lineages from the mainland, although they were also importing, on the other hand, in the same time, domestic lineages of cattle and sheep. It's also interesting to observe that so the so-called peripheral PPN region, like Cyprus, could have produced very original technical innovation, such as these deep wells that are mostly known today in Cyprus, not only of course, but most in Cyprus. This trends on the idea that maybe the PPN cultures were resulting from both diverse regional innovation and their transfer to other regions where they were integrated to the PPN, to local PPN package. Seven. The very poor local biodiversity of Cyprus allowed to identify transportation of animals that could not be evident on the continent, except with DNA sequences that, once more, uh, are, totally, that are unfortunately missing in Cyprus. For example, the very early management of wild boar and cat, the anthropogenic transfer of mice, foxes, or Mesopotamian fallow deer could only be evident because they were initially absent from Cyprus. No doubt that similar transportation were processed on the continent where they are, however, uh, undetectable. Last but not least, all this transportation, especially the one of big animals such as cattle, reveal unsuspected skills for such an early period for both construction and navigation techniques. But this is another story that we cannot develop furthermore in the framework of this presentation. I will stop there, but uh, I want first to, to, to thank you all very much. I hope we will have very interesting exchanges and discussion now. And I want also to, to, to thank all our numerous collaborators, excavators and collaborators, and especially those of them uh, that we use the, 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 the results in this presentation, Jérôme Robitaille for the Macro tool, Solange Vigo, which is somewhere among us uh, uh, for the, the beads and pendants, and uh, Pantelis Amidona, of course, on the right here on this picture. And also, I want to, to, to thank all the, the organisms and institutions that uh, allowed this uh, long work on Cyprus, uh, first led by Jean Guilaine and then by Francois and myself during the last 25 years, especially uh, the Ecole Francaise de Rome. Uh, and the Department of Antiquity of Cyprus. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you will have a good discussion now. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, it was very great talk and inspiring work. Uh, so Cyprus always uh, attract uh, our attention, of course, because of if if we think about the thousands of central Anatolian obsidian found in Akantu and your sites, uh, some of them, and the, the way they reach the island uh, deserves specific research also. So five years ago, uh, we visited the Muge site, Muge Sheketos, uh, uh, Akantu or Tatlusu. In North Cyprus. So uh, we want to, of course, visit the Kilimanas and other Neolithic sites uh, under excavation in the south. But the political uh, ob obstacles did not allow us uh, to cross the border, of course. Apparently, this will continue for some more time, I think. So uh, it was very good to. Uh, for us to see the site's detail, uh, detailly and listen to recent results directly from you. Thank you very much. So, uh, are there any questions? I think there are many questions, but who wants to... Okay, it's Mary wants to start. 
Um, hey, microphone. Yeah, I've got, I think I have it now. Um, uh, Jean-Denis and, and Francois, that, that was really a wonderful talk. And this is really magnificent research. I'm sure everyone will agree on that. And um, there's always new stuff coming, which is very exciting. Um, from Coming from the Ashikla experience, I, I have to admit I'm a little obsessed with sheep these days, and I was very curious what you had to say about the, um, the appearance of sheep on Cyprus and that there are two lineages. So a um, couple questions is, I understand, you know, the first lineage seems to appear very early. Um, how, do you, are you pretty sure about that date now. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about what this first lineage you identified was like? You were saying it's domesticated, so naturally we're, we're very curious about that. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Mary. Um, the family uh, sheep is uh, one of the last introductions. It's rather late in the history of, uh, of the introduction of Cyprus because uh, we have absolutely no evidence of sheep uh, for the early phase A of Chilocambos, that is the equivalent of the uh, early uh, PPND. Uh, we have only goats for sure, and, uh, but the, the, the sample is rather small and uh, I, I show it to a lot of different people in order to be sure that there were no, no sheep and uh, especially Paul Cross that I think at this occasion uh, confirmed more my, my impression. So there is no sheep before say um, 8,000 or 7,800 BC, which is relatively late and okay. including with reference to Ashukla uh, probably. Uh, and, uh, and second, we have a series of um, skulls, of, of fragments of skulls or horn calls, and a, a rather good set of measurements uh, for the early phase B in, uh, in uh, Chilocambos. And uh, it appears clearly that this sheep is already small, that the horn calls are already transformed. And this is why we consider that it arrived already modified by the mystification. And in addition, the the H45 uh, clearly indicates a rather sophisticated uh, system of, uh, of uh, uh, herding. So this is why we, we say that. So for me, this is pretty sure. What is less secure is this transition between uh, uh, the first form and the second form. It's very strange because in only one layer, we see the decreasing size of this sheep very, very fast on the 50 centimeter thick of the stratigraphy, the size is decreasing, decreasing, a very, very small sheep, and then <laughs> no more sheep. And then uh -huh. a big sheep is arriving in the upper layers. So this is why I, I suspect that there, there were probably a collapse of the probably local, uh, only at Chirocombos, I don't know, but there is a collapse. And the, what is sure is that the new sheep of the which is the equivalent of the cypher lay CPMB. CPMB. Uh, the, this new sheep is probably different, but I don't know from where he's coming. Of course, he can come out a lot of different places, South Levant, North Levant, Anatolia, whatever. This is a story that I know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, any Mirva? Microphone. Microphone kapal. Elin ve Elin kapal. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jean Denis and Francois. It was really great to to directly see some nice photos, and I have remarked that most of them are are unpublished. So um, the the photos and the no, we are really thankful about them. Um, my, my question is about the burial practices. I mean, uh, when we think of the close relation uh, between the island and the mainland, um, uh, we know that in, in Levant, uh, the, the, burial practice, the burials or the burial practices are so significant and one that uh, one expects to see some uh, 
influences on that. Can we can we hear a little about that burial practices in Cyprus? If yeah, th thank you very much, Marivan. It's a good opportunity to develop. <laughs> uh, first of all, what what we we didn't develop in the in our presentation is the situation for the PPNA. Of course, we have only two villages. But uh, either at, uh, at Pokrenos, Carol uh, McCartney, and in Primonas, we uh, discovered a very, very, very small number of human bones. Um, Francis Lemort studied the bones, so I just translate here what she uh, concluded. Um, the, in Primonas, you have seen that we have uh, nearly 5,000 uh, animal bones, so they are rather well preserved. And we have only, I don't remember, 13 or 14 human bones. Uh, out of 14, 12 are from the skull. Small fragments. And uh, out of 14, 12 are, have been found in the communal building. Uh, so uh, human burials are missing. I, I, I I suspect that we excavated a, 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 surf, a, surface, a surface large enough, but we never know. But what is uh, striking is that this is a situation that we, we found also in other sites or, or on the continent, especially in some PPNE areas around the, the Fretes Valley. I don't know exactly what is the situation in, uh, in Anatolia, but this absence and specific process of the human skulls is something that we found from somewhere else. And, uh, and then uh, the first um, burial that we found uh, later on is the baby burial, which is rather rare in the, in the early phase A of, of Shirokambos. So this is the uh, And then we have a series of individual uh, burials then a collective burial in uh, through time, then a collective burial, and then again a series of, of, of individual burials, which are um, more and more similar to the model which is well um, illustrated in Kirokitia, with these uh, individual burials with some offerings, very poor offerings. So there is a kind of um, of pattern now, which emerged from this uh, rather small documentation uh, in Cyprus, we we have to, to to increase this documentation, but uh, it could be really interesting, uh, of course, to, to to go deeper on the on the comparisons of the different areas of the country. What is your impression, Yeriban, uh, with this description of the burials uh, in Cyprus. Is it something similar to what you observed or? Uh, I think uh, Yilmaz is here. Yilmaz Hoca can, can answer for Anatolia. Yilmaz, Yilmaz, would you like to comment on this, on burial practices? But your microphone is Okay. In in general, or um, ah. in, uh, I can say that it, during the PPNA, uh, the the individual buried under the floor mainly, and there is no sex and gender differentiation. But in PPNB, and uh, there are some differences in Central Anatolia and the Southeastern Anatolia. And the type of the burial, uh, both um, the tr treatment on the human remains and the position of the burial, secondary treatment and secondary burials increased in PPMB. But there are also dec uh, a uh, decrease of the number of individuals in, uh, in the middle of the PPMB. And I can just say uh, something like this, and it is not easy to uh, make a general comment. 
because every settlement has own characteristic and we have to uh, we have also think about the settlement by settlement i think uh, this is enough for the uh, the general description of the very custom of uh, anatolia even it's true in the uh, girocombos because there is not any one burial which is similar to another one all of the each of them is uh, is different with different yeah. uh, practice different position different uh, stones or not uh, no stones and each of them is different mm -hmm. but also shirokombos was occupied during one millennium and a half and we have only i don't remember francois but maybe uh, 15 burials spread on this duration of course uh, it's difficult to have a, a general view of what happened yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So, Ellen here. Ellen, do, do, do you want to say something? Your microphone is. Were, were you Were you talking to me? I, I couldn't quite hear. Yes. Yes. Oh, Hello. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, great to see you all. Um, I haven't seen many of you for a long time. Um, great presentation. Uh, it's just amazing that, you know, every year we're learning something new. And um, of course, as Jean-Denis would, would know, my main disagreement is the accumulation of bones at uh, uh, Akrotiri. Uh, we argue it's not at all natural, but that's a different story. But what, what I think is really interesting now is filling in that gap between the late Epipaleolithic and the early Neolithic, uh, as your survey is showing. And we, we've just started a new s survey near um, Larnaca as well, which of course is curtailed now and have found several sites that appear to be contemporary with Akrotiri or at least Epipaleolithic. Uh, this is with, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on names here, but, um, um, Lisa Marr, I'm sorry, and um, we we hope to be able to return. Uh, there's some fairly rich surface sites, but of course those are always going to be difficult to um, to date. But they have very very distinctive artifacts similar to what what you're seeing at the other Epipaleolithic sites. So it's uh, we can hope the island will open up again, and um, there's there's just a tremendous amount of work. Um, going on. So it, it was really great seeing the summary of, of your uh, regional work as well. Uh, I, I, uh, it's interesting if you if you can find some uh, other sites with uh, good structures uh, similar to, to uh, Cotiri, it would be really important to, to have information for this period. But uh, our, uh, as Francois uh, emphasized, we think that the lithic industry that we found in surface during our pedestrian surveys on the uh, Arminokori Plateau are not the same as the one uh, of uh, Etocrenos. It's something different, really. Something is something different to all what we already see in Cyprus, either earlier or later. So it would be really important to discover these sites and have good uh, information. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, um, as I said, we, we actually are in the ironic situation of having funding uh, to look at these sites, but we can't get to them because of the COVID uh, restrictions. And what's interesting, just, just as a uh, side comment, uh, this is with, with uh, Lisa Marr, uh, Sally Sturt, and um, McDaniel. So it's a, a joint project and um, the, the rich sites are overlooking the sea and right below them in each case um, are rock shelters, which would really be interesting to take a look at because that's a parallel situation to Akrotiri. So I guess we just have to wait and see. So uh, we will meet uh, on the field when it will be possible and uh, exchange uh, <laughs> visiting the site uh, once to the other, <laughs> hopefully yeah. in a short time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Miguel, are you here? Miguel Shevketolo. 
We get yes, here she is. Yes, she is here. Mara. Mike, do you hear the voice? Okay. Uh, maybe Mike is busy now. Uh, okay, Joanna, please. Yes. Uh, hi, Jean Denis. It's good to see you. It's Joe Clark here. Um, mm -hmm. I wondered. Um, of course, you will. You you expect this from from me. I wondered why you hadn't mentioned um, Calabasas Tenta uh, in relationship to Shilu Kambos, and I wondered if you could um, uh, perhaps elaborate or just give me some idea of um, what you think about the two sites in comparison with each other. Tenta is broadly contemporary um, to Shilu Kambos, but it is incredibly different, really, in terms of its architecture, and I wondered what your views were on, on that, and if you could elaborate on that. Um, so good evening, I'm happy to, to see you. Uh, thank you for this question. I think that uh, uh, it's not, uh, there, there are not so many differences uh, in, the, in the building system. If you compare Tenta with uh, the, the middle and, uh, and late phases of Shiro Cambos. Jean Guilain would speak of that much better, much better than me, but in the, in the second uh, monograph uh, of Shiro Cambos that we have just finished uh, yesterday, uh, we, 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 uh, Jean Guilain wrote uh, um, uh, a good comparison between uh, Tenta and, uh, and Shiro Cambos. Uh, so we didn't spoke of that. It's not because it's not interesting. Of course, it's very interesting, but it's because we we, we selected some topics and and uh, and in, once more Jean Guilain would have spoken of that much better than than us. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, hypo, your hypothesis of uh, of PPNA uh, big building in, in Tenta. Um, you know, I'm not totally convinced and it's difficult now because uh, we would have to re-excavate uh, it with a new approach. Of course, at that time it was not possible, but, uh, but, but I think uh, in my, personally, uh, I think it's a really interesting hypothesis and it, it's rather satisfactory to see that a lot of questions that, that are what that were attached to, to this uh, building uh, would be uh, resolved by this kind of interpretation. So I, I think it's, uh, it's really interesting. It's a pity that it's not possible to scale deeper around uh, and, and, and check if there are some PPNA uh, uh, dwellings. But uh, anyways, uh, it's, I think it's something that we have to include in the reflection, in our reflection of the PPNA um, in, uh, in site. But uh, unfortunately, there is no, in my knowledge, there is no lithic associated, no, it's difficult to find in the collection. There isn't. You know, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't, there's right. only one sounding that goes down deep into that um, I know, I building. Know. Actually, I was sorry to, to um, just ask you one more question. Um, actually, I, I was really interested in the late PPMB and the fact that there are no pillar buildings, no buildings with pillars at Shilu Kambos. And there are so many at Tenta, and I was wondering what you thought about that. I don't know. <laughs> I have no answer. It's a, you know, uh, this is what we discussed just before the beginning of the conference. It seems that each site is, is a special case, even if you compare, uh, for example, uh, Alan, uh, um, I see Ortiz with uh, uh, Akantu with uh, uh, Shiro Combos and you have it and Penta uh, at a similar time because all these sites uh, function probably uh, during the second half of the uh, 18th millennium. They are different the one from the other. You can find some generality uh, common to, to all of them, but they are really specific. Uh, so it would be interesting to 
to, to have all the results of the of the excavations and uh, analysis of this site and be able to have a, a small workshop in order to really draw together the the, the substance of this comparison and, and try to see what is common and what is really special to each site. Uh, comparing what is comparable, that is to say, at the same chronology. And this is also a question. What is exactly the chronology? <laughs> so we have seen, you, you have a C14 on charcoal, of course, or, or even C, but they are only dating the C, then the charcoal, and, the, and in this big site, uh, which have been uh, removed a lot of time because of uh, embedded dwellings and this and that. It's really difficult to have very refined chronology. And uh, we have very refined chronologies in Cremonas for uh, a very simple reason. The reason is that we are very lucky because this site has not been occupied before and has not been occupied after, except during the Sosira period. So it's easy to differentiate, not always, but it's easy. And these sites have been uh, occupied only for a very short time. So here we can have refined chronology, but it's not comparable to anything else <laughs> because it's too, it's too short. <laughs> okay. Thanks. First, Natalie, uh, and then second uh, will be Juan Ho. Okay, um, good evening. Thank you, Jean Denis and Francois, for your. Nice it was great yeah. to see everything in one place. Um, it's a impressive story. Um, I'm, I've been really interested in the recent work that members of your team have been doing on uh, recent pigs um, and in captivity and the kinds of morphological changes that have resulted. And I'm wondering if you've actually thought about, well, I assume you've thought about it, and this is part of the point, but if you've actually started applying. Um, any of those results to your case in Cyprus and how that might relate to the enclosures that you're potentially seeing and local processes of domestication. Yes, of course. You can see behind me the desk of this guy, which is Thomas Fiti, who is part of our group uh, in Cyprus also. Uh, yes, we are, just, we, are, we are just finishing to write the paper for the monograph about that. And uh, I can tell you some, some things. Uh, First, we, we applied the geometric morphometric approach to the, to the large series of Kimona, Shirokambo, and compared with uh, Chayoni, Moraybet, and this and that. So this is done, and this clearly indicates that this uh, wild born Cyprus was a, very, a, a, small, a small one, not very small, but it was a small uh, endemic uh, insular uh, form. Um, and uh, and uh, the most your question uh, was focused on the mobility of these animals. Where are they captive or where are they run uh, freely? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the the technique that they uh, they they, uh, they created uh, uh, on the calcaneus is uh, very efficient on the modern uh, collection. Uh, but uh, it's not uh, very efficient on archaeological collections because of two reasons. First, uh, the calcaneus are often broken. And, and second, uh, we need the, the epiphysis fused to the bone for a complete approach of a surface uh, analysis. And uh, as you know, um, most of the suites on the, on the site everywhere are uh, young uh, suites. So we have not a lot of uh, calcanei. They analyzed uh, two uh, calcanei from uh, Timonas and nine from Chirocambos of, of the middle and, and, and recent phases. Uh, it's interesting because for Chirocambos, only two samples, but the two samples uh, told the same story. Uh, they, are, they were uh, freely run, no problem. But it works, you know, it works because they, they plot really in the, in the good place <laughs> with reference to, to the modern uh, uh, experiment. Uh, for Shiro Kambos, it's interesting also because uh, we, have, we have both. We have uh, on the nine individuals, two, uh, if I remember, are really um, uh, showing uh, clear trends to captive life. And uh, the other, uh, um, indicate uh, uh, freely range, freely 
um, mobility. Uh, and uh, this is coherent with, with what I, I found with the traditional uh, morphometric analyses and with uh, H profiles and this and that. Because uh, in this period, if you combo that you see around the 7,400, 7,200, uh, we have uh, a decrease of the pig uh, rearing and um, a, a return of hunting. And uh, in, the, in the linear morph uh, morphometric data, I see these two groups at that time. And uh, there is also these two groups on the nine uh, calcanin. So it's, just, it's a kind of experimental study at that time, but uh, they, they will probably develop uh, this technique on other boats, which are much more, much better preserved and, uh, and more numerous on the site. Um, and uh, especially uh, we will try to develop, uh, because we have the material, the experimental material is over there. We have the skeleton, the scans of all the individuals and this and that, which is really fantastic. Uh, and uh, we will develop this on other bones, probably the talus, but it's not exactly, talus is not mechanically in the same position as calcaneus because there is no uh, muscle insertion on, on, on it and this and that. But this is ongoing, and, and I'm really um, uh, optimistic for the, the development of these techniques uh, in the archaeological uh, assembly. Thank you. OK, Juan, how are you? Hi, thank you. How are you? Hello. Uh, thank are you very you? much. Nice Hi. to see you. Hi. <laughs> thank you. It's a very <laughs> wonderful conference. Thank you, Jean-Denis and Francois. Uh, I was interested, uh, if I understood well, you found uh, bipolar technology in Kimonas, and this is also very new. Uh, maybe uh, there could be some uh, conclusions you, you could explain about that, uh, about this kind of technology, because this is, um, seems to be uh, quite, quite parallel in chronology to what is happening in the Middle Euphrates. So wh what do you think about that? Uh, well, well, there is no problem with uh, this core technology because uh, uh, in the epinatation uh, uh, period, uh, bipolar, uh, bidirectional uh, technology exists. And uh, in the case of, um, of Climonas, um, uh, there is no uh, 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 central blades uh, like uh, uh, Euphrat Valley. Uh, uh, the, the, the technology described by uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, um, from uh, Murray Bay, etc., and um, and uh, in the in in the Klimonas assemblages, uh, this technology is not uh, is not um, uh, the same uh, with the the, the Murray Bay uh, for, for, for from the the, the PPNB. Uh, or, or uh, PPNA, PPNB uh, transition, like uh, uh, Armar, for example. There is no uh, big, uh, big arrays uh, uh, like uh, the, 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 the level of, there is just one uh, big array found in the communal building, um, the, but uh, all the, the the heroids are the, the small size, and uh, there is no uh, bipolar on, on, on the heroids. There is no uh, bipolar uh, technology, or very few, very few. And uh, this bipolar core technology, it's a very, uh, very rare, very uh, the, the maximum of the, 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 the cores are conical or pyram pyramidal, uh, uh, like the late PPNA, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, on the north of uh, Levant. Okay. You, you agree? Or? Yeah, okay. No, no, yes. Uh, yeah, it's not, uh, but, it, but it's, this is not uh, like uh, a predominant unipolar technology that is uh, uh, modified or recovered by uh, another uh, uh, secondary cause. So, so, so we are, we are, uh, in your, so in your side, you have the exploitation comes from both 
both platforms. Is it true? Or yes, uh, exact, exact. Yeah, there is a, yeah. uh, sometimes there is some uh, uh, bipolar course with a uh, uh, second uh, platform, opposite platform, just for correct the, the surface yeah. of the debitage. And uh, it's not, uh, in this case, it's not a, case. a bipolar technology, uh, we, we, we know. Uh, but um, the, the, the picture presented in this conference uh, um, showed uh, uh, some rectangular uh, uh, bipolar core and uh, with two uh, inclinated uh, uh, platform, two opposite inclinated uh, platform and uh, Probably it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bipolar, it's bipolar, but uh, not uh, not on the on the term of uh, of uh, PP, um, early PPNB uh, uh, model uh, like uh, Euphrat Valley. Okay, thank you. Okay, second. Okay, uh, two hands. Uh, first, Daniela, and then and Trey Roger. Hi, uh, very nice to see you all and thank you very much for this great Jimmy. talk, uh, Jean-Denis and Francois. Um, I wanted to ask an old question that uh, repeats at least in my head, I don't know about others, and that's about uh, the connection between the mainland and the island. We know well um, the very many types of um, uh, uh, materials that came from the mainland to the island, including uh, animals, including the wheat, including, uh, for example, carnelian, uh, obsidian, and so on. And I wondered whether anyone, you or anyone else, maybe on this panel, is aware of anything that may have come from Cyprus to the mainland. And um, I can just say that I've been looking for picrolite and haven't found it yet anywhere um, that I work. Uh, and that's as, as far as raw material, that would be one of the most obvious raw materials to move, if, if any. But actually the previous question about uh, lithic technology got me thinking that and I, I just wonder aloud and, and I'm not a lithic expert at all, but I wonder whether, could it be that any lithic technology may have been developed in Cyprus first and then arrived in the mainland? Hi, Daniela. I will begin to, 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 um, to try to answer, but I will not succeed, of course, in your first question, and I will leave it off for the second part. Um, in my knowledge, nothing uh, has been identified on the continent coming from Cyprus, but uh, it's it's always difficult, of course. Uh, I don't know if there is something very, very uh, totally similar to the picolite on the continent. I don't know. It's the question that we ask, and maybe uh, uh, Solange, uh, who is somewhere over there, uh, have any idea about that. But um, but. I just have one very general uh, answer. It, this is a, a, a biological, biogeographical uh, answer. Uh, biogeographists who study uh, uh, polarity always say that nothing comes back from the island. It's a well. Uh, but this is, a, this is a biological approach. And it would be interesting to have a, a, a counter example in the cultural framework. Well, you actually mentioned the wells earlier as a possibility. Yes, maybe, but we have, we, you, you have also wells in, uh, in uh, South Levant, uh, which are more or less uh, contemporaneous. It's difficult to say. Of course, there are a lot of wells in Cyprus, in two sites. Maybe we have been very lucky. Maybe it's a very local signature, and we cannot demonstrate that uh, they inspired uh somebody on the on the on the continent it would be it's something that i suggested in my presentation but <laughs> it's something disputable of course also do you want to, to complete uh, my, so, uh, may, may, uh, maybe uh, uh solange can can be uh speak yeah. about uh, the the beads and the, yeah. the raw material yes yeah uh, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, from the personal ornament perspective, there is no clear evidence of influence from Cyprus to the mainland. But the spondylus industry from Crimonas is the earliest spondylus industry known so far. So clearly, it's a local innovation. And spondylus industry are attested late, oh, also during the PPNB in Cyprus, but also during the PPNB and later uh, in the Near East, in the Asian area, and even later in Europe. So it's difficult to know if it's like several independent innovation in different areas, or if something was really, really like invented in the island and the ID spread in the mainland, even if they use in the mainland some other local raw material to do the same. So for me, that, that would be the, the question to dig, but the methodologic, methodological tool to, to dig this perspective is uh, tricky to develop. Thank you. Nikos, it looks like Nikos maybe wants to say something about this. What about, uh, hello everyone. <laughs> Uh, you mean, uh, Daniela, in terms of uh, insularity? Yeah. It's a very tricky notion. Very, very tricky notion. Different people use it in a very different way. And I'm not sure we, we, we could agree on, on uh, what insularity means. It means you know, different things to different people. Uh, so I don't, I, I'm not sure I can... Uh, I, I, will, I will try to look for materials and objects coming from Cyprus to the continent. You know, the prehistory of uh, the Levant is so dominant. Uh, and uh, you have to be uh, very courageous to try to look for things coming the other way around. Uh, it, it, it's a psychological state of mind, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I wanted to just to say a few things about some other early sites which exist in Cyprus, which I'm sure my French uh, colleagues know about it. I'm talking about uh, the inland site of Rudias, which has produced, um, and it's, it's, it's bound to be published, some early dates. Uh, of course, they are OSL dates, and uh, you know some people don't... Uh, are not ready to believe on the, the, the kind of dates uh, they come from this from this uh, method, but uh, still, it's it's a very um, uh, very early dates, and they come in a very uh, good order. Uh, there are four dates uh, which start uh, from the deep deposit, uh, deep stratigraphy of the site, about one meter and twenty centimeters. And it gives us a date of 12,700. Of course, I know that the, the, the range of the era uh, is quite wide. It's about uh, uh, 1,000 years. Uh, but, but still, it's interesting to have that feeling that the people, they may, may have arrived to Cyprus quite early. Uh, before and before Akrotiri, or, or even um, a thousand years uh, before. Uh, the, the rest of the dates, the other three dates, which are, as I, as I said, uh, in a very good order, uh, the, the second order date uh, uh, comes from um, 90 centimeters deep uh, stratigraphy and now layer. And it gives us a date of uh, something like 10,000 years BC, plus minus, of course, I don't know, more than 1,000 years. But still, it's, it's, it's interesting to see uh, also the, uh, that, discuss that possibility. Of course, uh, we lack of um, radiocarbon dates, the, old, the, the, the classic uh, ordinary uh, radiocarbon dates coming from, from charcoal, and many people may be suspicious about the dates, uh, the OSL dates, but, but still the, the, the lithics um, are, um, that they are interesting, quite interesting, because they, they come from uh, uh, three assemblages, starting from the lowest one, 
um, and they show some very early uh, characteristics. Uh, of course, they are not very typical of, of the epipaleolithic, except of a couple of uh, lunates. But still, uh, it's interesting to know that there's another site which may produce at some point um, a long stratigraphic, uh, long stratigraphy for the very early period of the of the of the, of the island. Um, we we try to uh, go back. Um, um, Carol McCartney is, is doing the lithics, and she's very optimistic that, that uh, we may be able to fill the gap um, uh, we're looking for. I'm uh, um, talking about B the PP and A gap. Uh, of course, they are not um, represent the site is not a very typical in a site, but still, still we may have some. Uh, uh, we have some the missing link between the early uh, the early uh, lithics uh, assemblages and the later ones, uh, which are which uh, go reach the the Neolithic uh, period. Uh, it's in a very interesting site, uh, which um, it's a palimpsest, of course, but, but still it may produce uh, in the near future if the COVID situation improves, it may produce some interesting results. Uh, this this is the uh, this is the kind of uh, from my point of view what I, I would um, offer in this very interesting meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for completing our presentation because we, we didn't focus too much on the, on this early site. There are several other places in Cyprus, including, of course, uh, what you just mentioned, your excavation. Um, and and uh, it's important uh, to, it would be important also here to, to have a confrontation of all these uh, early sites in order to try to, to sort out the, the, the different chronological um, periods, because I suspect that there are a lot of different chronological periods. And uh, as you mentioned, probably palimpsest in, in several of the sites, your site, and also some of the sites that have been published by Albert Emmerman. So I think it's something which indicates a, a complex and rich story for this uh, epipaleolithic period. And maybe we will know more in a few years, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Trevor Watkins, please, Trevor. <clears throat> Hi, uh, uh, Jean Denis and uh, Francois. That was a, a, a great presentation. I'm very, very uh, grateful. You know, you've given us lots of things to, to think about and some, some new material which I didn't know about, which is fascinating. Uh, I, I want to go to the uh, um, the the uh, PPMB, particularly that was the later PPMB. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, at a time when things are becoming more and more um, uh, networked it, on the mainland in PPMB, yeah, uh, Cyprus seems to be becoming less connected, less involved in, in uh, uh, its contacts with the uh, with the mainland. And I wondered if you've got any. Uh, well, first of all, would you do you agree with that that it, that uh, as the PPMB proceeds? There are fewer and fewer contacts, less and less obsidian, um, less uh, um, um, uh, borrowing of the or in, involvement in the uh, stone tool technology altogether, uh, uh, and um, more innovations of their of their own. Would you agree that they're, that they are becoming less involved? Uh, but it's, it's strange. Do you think that? What, why do you think they're growing less involved? It seems to me there are two possibilities. One is they're failing. They no longer can, can, can take, participate in the, in the Levantine network uh, as they had previously. And the other is that the exact opposite of that hypothesis, that they were a successful independent cultural entity and they no longer needed to uh, be so concerned with, with their uh, Levantine neighbors. Hi, Trevor. Thank you very much. And I have to, to, to thank, we have to thank you because uh, this conference are rooted in the, your initiative uh, in, in Berlin uh, several years ago, and it was a, a great time for us, and I think it made it push our reflection uh, to, to the place where it is today. So you are uh, 
we are really we acknowledge your your action. Um, yes, your, uh, obviously, Francois will maybe complete or prolong. Uh, it, it seems that uh, uh, at the end of the sequence of Chiro combos and during uh, the occupation of Chiro Sicilia, the Chiro Sicilia period, the Cyprus is um, is uh, more particular. And uh, it seems that the connectivity with the continent is reducing, but um, I, would, I would be personally cautious with this interpretation for two reasons. Uh, first, if we look at the mice, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you look at the mice uh, in Chaosicia, uh, it seems that they uh, didn't diverge uh, more than the mice of Shiro combos from the, the, the continent mice. That means that probably the, the exchanges by sea was not reducing uh, intensity because they were able to, 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 to transport it this mice at high intensity. Uh, so this is not a, a de definitive evidence, but it makes me cautious. And, and the second uh, reason why I'm cautious is that um, we, we suspected a very low connectivity before Kirokitia, uh, when we didn't know anything about that time. And finally, there were a, a very high connectivity. So it's difficult to me to, to, to think that uh, connectivity suddenly decreased. I think that the contact with the continent uh, by voyaging uh, on the sea was still important. But I think that one of the components of this evolution of the of the late uh, PTMB, PTMC, and, and partly Neolithic is uh, an increase of the characteristic of the original uh, signatures. Um, and uh, so at, when you look at the material, you, it's clear that there is, uh, um, uh, that it seems that Cyprus is closing on itself. But I, I think that it's, more or less the same in some other areas in the in the continent at the, at the same period, and uh, I, I will be cautious for that with that. But maybe you have different impressions. So long, should we have any information? Or... Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I. It's it's uh, it's sure that at the at the end of the PPMB and later in Cyprus, uh, from the personal ornament perspective, they start to develop some particularities in at least in the shell frequencies that they use in their personal ornaments. It seems something different from the mainland, but the shell diversity is not. Um, Besides the, the frequencies, the, 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 it's similar shells from the mainland and, the, and Cyprus. It's really a question of numbers. And regarding the greenstone materials, they also, also start to develop like new shape and new type of beads uh, at the, after the PPNB, which were not uh, identified and recognized uh, in the PPNA and PPNB. But, uh, but it's, uh, even in the island, it's highly diverse. And the diversity in the mainland is not still fully documented neither. So it's sure that locally it's, it's changed, but, uh, but it will be, I think, mandatory to have more systematic comparison with a huge diachronic perspective on the both side of the, of the sea to really clarify the, the, the view of the different changes. Can I just add one? one uh, uh little uh, point that I, I'm so grateful, always so grateful to Jean Denis and his colleagues, uh, Jean Guilain uh, earlier, uh, many, many years ago, as uh, Jean Denis will know, I wrote an article in which I argued that the uh, uh, absence of evidence was not the evidence of absence uh, uh, in the pre hierarchitia Cyprus. I was heavily criticized in Britain for that. I got some very, very crude criticisms from some of my British senior colleagues yeah, for writing so, uh, so uh, uh, confidently about uh, uh, evidence that wasn't there. So I've always been enormously grateful to you, Jean Denis, and I should continue to be for the rest of my years for, for showing that uh, that, was a, that was a good guess I made then. Yeah?
Okay. Uh, Miguel, are you still here? Miguel. Do you name Bosa? Yes. And hello to Master Trevor. Hi there. I can't see you. Um, oh, I think my are. camera. <laughs> Most of you don't know, maybe, but Master Trevor was my PhD supervisor. I owe everything to him. Only the good things, bad things are my own doing. Do, do, do you want to add something about the northern part of that story? Um, well, I mean, uh, two years ago, we excavated a new site just a kilometer east of Akantu. It proved the uh, earlier dates to our surprise and something totally different that Cyprus experienced. So the Cypriot archeology span continues to surprise us. And the question of where the Cypriots came or where, where the initial colonizers came is going to continue to um, puzzle us for a very long time, I think. Um, but recently I was thinking, since I had a chance being isolated and going into the fields alone, I realized that the initial colonizers, whether they brought the animals or not, I was thinking, let's say we can see the mountains from both sides and they can travel to the north, clearly to the, Akantu is a perfect place to arrive um, because of the north coast location. They actually, if they traveled in the springtime, winter and springtime, they had plenty of wild plants to survive. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever touched at this point, but you can survive. You can survive by collecting the wild plants that um, we even today have, which must be less than it existed in 10,000 years ago. And of course you have the sea and the fishing and if they were seafarers, uh, they know how to fish as well. Um, for the burial question that was asked in Akantu, we don't have burials. We have a ditch five meters wide, two meters deep, and some fragments of human bones, mainly jaw, skull. One, probably the largest thing we ever found was um, belonging to a woman, as part of a skull and some neck vertebra and the arm face down. I interpreted this as a violent death. My co-director Ian Hansen said, no, um, it's not a violent death. It was probably treated some kind of like smoked since all our occupation layers were cleared and dumped into the ditch. Now he's a foreign physical archaeologist and I, I was a stubborn and I, we agreed to disagree basically on the basis of the fact that I have a Paphian blood and Paphians are well known for being stubborn. So if it is smoked and um, kind of um, mummified, then maybe this will tell us something else about the connection with the Levant or Anatolian burials. But with this, I want to ask a question to actually to Ganesh and Mishraban Hojanam that I've been following all the lectures about uh, since the beginning. The burials that you have in the houses in Anatolia, have you done any seasonal tests? Can we actually identify the season of the burials inside the houses? The reason I ask this is I know how cold Anatolia gets into winter and how difficult the outside um, tombs can be excavated. So I was wondering if they are dug in the winter, whether they are preferred to dug into the houses simply because it's easier to dig a pit in the house than outside.
So explanation of the question. Thank you, Miguel. I can just um, answer uh, that uh, question with another question. <laughs> I mean, as usual, you know. Uh, the, the thing is, um, the burials at Ashiklu, at least, uh, the, the ones, uh, all, all the burials are dug into the houses, the ones that we find. And, uh, but the thing is, we have no idea, and uh, that, that uh, the number of the people are quite uh, small when compared to the, to the population. We simply do not know anything about the others who were buried out of the settlement, extramural, eh, or elsewhere. We we simply don't know. So we cannot um, we cannot um, we cannot compare actually, or we cannot estimate uh, generally uh, the the. Uh, the barriers, we, we don't know about the season uh, that they were buried. And I think it's a little difficult. I don't know how we can do that. <laughs> if, uh, I mean, uh, except the analysis, um, the chemical analysis on bones maybe, but uh, I, I simply don't know don't know the, the season or I mean I cannot uh, answer you clearly let me say Dinesh, do you, would no, you like to I mean, add in, something in in terms of building with that we have very few skeletons we can say I mean almost 90s less than hundreds we already dug probably more than 400 400 buildings. So, but we call the burial customs uh, in Ashikle always underneath the floor. But perhaps there's a different burial custom, the parallel, parallel. Yeah, yeah, there Very has to be different, 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 different practices. There has to be, but we simply don't know. So, Eleni, uh, she has a long. Uh, Eleni, are you here? Or you just left your note and then it's not it's not a question. It's just yeah. a general comment. Maybe Zantani would like to comment on that. But I look, I'm not an expert in Cypriot uh, prehistory, but my general feeling has been for some time reading through the publications and the reports that of all this amazing work that our colleagues have been doing on Cyprus. Um, it always felt like there is, it's this massive piece of land. And let's not forget that Cyprus is one, probably the largest island in the Mediterranean, okay? That is offshore, basically, off the coast. But it always felt like it is a part of the mainland. Like calling Cyprus an island in the context of the prehistory of the Neolithic, the early Neolithic archaeology of Southwest Asia always seemed to be something of an overstatement. Uh, obviously, insularity, talking about insularity, it is easier when it comes to dealing with phenomena of domestication, with the animals introduced or reintroduced at different points, with some things coming in earlier than others, then you have the feral goats and the pigs being domesticated locally, obviously, okay? What is endemic? What isn't in this context? Is endemism a matter of definition? But when it comes to the general processes, you just see another region of the mainland in some ways with peculiarities, particularities arising, coming in and out, as it happens actually on the mainland. I mean, do we, when we deal with Cyprus, do we actually overemphasize the peculiarities because it happens to be an island? But when you go just across the, the sea barrier over to the 
the Levantine area, you also see peculiarities there, but we, they, we tend to not perhaps pay too much attention to them because they happen to be on the mainland. I'm just raising this more as an intellectual point for discussion here. It's not a question as such, but perhaps a theme worth exploring. And let's not forget that Cyprus, I know that this, this epipaleolithic question is always looming there, but it does remain a fact. We know it for a fact that Cyprus was a known destination for centuries, millennia uh, before the PPN. So it was always there, it was known. I mean, can we really talk about Neolithic expansion when it comes to Cyprus? As a process of colonization in the classic sense of the term. I think, I think it's Bill also agree with you, Eleni. You have a one supporter already. Really? Yes. Bill, I, support, I support Eleni too. It's not the Greek. It's not the Greek side. No, it's not the Greek side. It's. <laughs> I uh, agree uh, with, with what uh, she said. Uh, I, I also agree with most of your purpose because one one of our main um, topic during these last years was to show that finally uh, the the PPN at least. Uh, uh, that we know in Cyprus is nothing else than uh, uh, original var variants of the, the PPN of, of, the, of the continent. Uh, that is, it, it's not, uh, the, the cultural aspects are not marked by the, the insularity, for me it's clear, um, but, but uh, you cannot negate the, the, the fact that the biodiversity is not the same. You cannot negate that in this territory, like in many other peripheral territories uh, on the continent, uh, admittedly, uh, the, the Neolithic uh, developed later on or a bit later on as on the continent. This is a question for Cyprus. We don't know what happened during the 10th millennium. So there is, it, it's anyways a, a peripheral territory before being an insular territory from, the, for, for, from this point of view. And, and also there are some important questions. The question that uh, Trevor rose before, which is the, the, why this uh, Kirokitia culture is so different from the, the other culture of the continent. This is something that we, we have to, to think of uh, in terms of remote place. You cannot, uh, who, who of us here on the screen is able tomorrow morning to transport of cattle uh, to Cyprus easily uh, and to breed it and to produce a local population. Um, it's not so easy. Uh, you have technical um, difficulties to solve for, for doing that. Uh, why, why is there no musterian in, in Cyprus? Maybe there are and we never found it, of course, but at that time we have not. Uh, why the hippos lived so long time when they were so easy to, to, to hunt, and we have seen this on many other islands. Insularity is not absent from the question. I think that from a cultural point of view, I completely agree with you. Uh, for the PPN period that we know, uh, there is no boundary between the continent and the island. That's clear. Uh, but uh, we have to look uh, more in detail to what happened before, after, and to, to what in the constitution of this culture can be, come from the insularity. And, and this is a component of the system anyway. In other regions, you have the mountain, and this is a component of the system. So uh, can, I, I agree mostly with you, but not totally. <laughs> I don't know, is there a Musterian in Central Anatolian, Kines? Yes. Oh, oh yes. Yes? Oh, okay. yes. Send me the references. So, any, any, any question?
Yes, I have a question. Please. Yes, please, Ella. Yeah, uh, bonsoir, Jean Denis et François. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. Thank you. Actually, I was uh, curious that you didn't mention anything about any other manifestation regarding the symbolic system, uh, any other besides body ornaments, of course. But um, I don't know something about uh, the um, iconography, uh, figurines. Um, I don't know, uh, especially talking about the PPNA and the potential influences from the Levant. So I was thinking that maybe you have any evidence about uh, mm. these symbolic uh, 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 possible transfer to, yeah. to Cyprus. So the, the, corp the corpus is very, is very small in the PPNA. The corpus of uh, symbolic objects is very small finding. Uh, Solange uh, studied most of it, and uh, the picture that uh, we presented in the presentation uh, coming from her um, collect not all, but a large part of the of this symbolic picture. What was absent in our presentation is, say, um, ten, uh, five to ten objects which are seen in some small figurines, very stylized in limestone. And finally, the most striking uh, symbolic object was not found in Trimonas, but in Astrochronos, in the form of this uh, small uh, statues that you probably know, which have been published by, by Carol McCartney, which is a, a human figuration. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's rather very poor, finally, uh, very modest. And this is when you compare with uh, Gebekli, for example, <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing, uh, even uh, when you compare with uh, Jeff El Armar, or it's very, so very... For the ornaments, I mean. Sorry? When you compare this uh, very small corpus to the to the effects that you have on body ornaments, can you say anything about this? I mean... Uh, I, I will leave uh, Solange answering the question. <laughs> yes, can you repeat the question, please? So I said, uh, if you ca can you give any interpretation about the small corpus or a small amount of any other symbolic manifestations beside, yeah. but yeah. how can you explain that? Even for the personal ornament, compared to the amount of bone remains and flint remains, the personal ornament collection is not so big, in fact. It's rich compared to classic uh, archaeological site, uh, like Paleolithic site, uh, or a paleolithic site. I don't know. It's rich, but compared to the other category of remains in the site, it's really it's small, in fact. But uh, what may explain the, the 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 presence of the very few symbolic artifact is that we have only occupation sites, uh, more or less uh, specialized uh, with the communal building, uh, with the village. Uh, there is another PPNA site with few artifacts and so on, but we have no idea of what was buried with uh, dead people. And maybe that most of the symbolic production was left in another place with the dead, and we have absolutely no idea. Because this is, um, I think this is what published uh, Petenburg in uh, 91. He observed that uh, for the picolite material, uh, for the Sotira period, so the ceramic period, uh, it's a later period on the island, and most of the personal ornaments are in the burials, and there is very, very few compared in the occupation sites. So maybe this is something that still uh, remain to be investigated, but because we have no idea of the of the of the mortuary practice, maybe we miss large part of the symbolic production because they were not let within the living place. Well, even in Churacambos, uh, there are very very little uh, number of uh, ornaments in, in the in the in the burials, in the the collective burial, nearly nothing except some uh, animal bones uh, offerings. Uh, Antlers and things like that, uh, and in the individual burials of the more recent period, uh, we have nearly nothing except in the in the cat burial, in the human cat burial, where there are some bits that we studied so long. It's really very poor. Uh, maybe they are elsewhere or at sea. <laughs> okay. 
Thanks. So any comments, any questions? If, uh, if may I add to yes. what uh, Saint Denis has said, just said, which I, I agree with. Um, I think uh, the the sea is uh, which makes the difference. Just crossing even twenty and thirty miles of the, of the sea, you may uh, it makes you think in a very different way. See what happened in the Aegean. You know, when you leave Anatolia behind and you cross uh, the Aegean to reach uh, the Greek uh, continent, uh, mainland, uh, you, you forget everything. I'm talking about all these symbolic uh, cosmos, uh, all that very rich, overwhelming evidence of uh, symbolism. Uh, I'm talking about Central Anatolia, of course. Uh, when you 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 get your feet on the boat and you cross the Aegean, it seems you forget everything. I don't know what's happening. I, I, I don't think I don't have an, any any answer to that. May I comment? But, but, on but, that? but still, it's it's a matter of fact. This may perhaps happen to Cyprus also. You know, from, from the time the, from the moment they they left the Levantine coast. In red Cyprus, everything has changed. But not like Kirikatia. I mean, Kirikatia has some very rich burials with loads of beautiful stone bowls, you know, and a couple of stone bowls, in fact, that have the same um, animal motifs on it that you see in developing on the mainland all the way down into the late Neolithic mm. streets talk coming up very soon about these. Um, pottery bowls, we have the same motif at Kirikatia. Um, so, you know, there are very rich burials in Cyprus, just not that, not at every site, I think, is what I would say. And the other thing about some of the burials at Kirikatia is they look uncannily like some of the burials on the mainland. Okay. Uh if I pronounce right, Solange. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, no, just to comment. In fact, maybe part of the of the symbolic thought. Uh, it's not that they are like lost or forgotten during the the, the, the process of peopling of Cyprus, but maybe people who sail to Cyprus do not represent all the social uh, composition of what is present in the mainland. And may, may, maybe it's only a very small part of the, of the population who go to Cyprus, like maybe crafters, uh, maybe not all the, you know, specialized people, not all the people in charge of the activities in the full uh, community. And it's only demographically and socially speaking, maybe it's a very small part of the population who voyage to Cyprus. And that's why not all the social statues are not represented in the symbolic uh, individual and social statues are not represented in all the symbolic production present in Cyprus, at least at the beginning, because after that they have to, to rebuild all their community. But maybe at the beginning, it's a kind of a sorted population who arrived in Cyprus. Maybe they want to left behind. Jean-Denis, uh, your microphone. Just to, to, to add a small uh, complement to this discussion, it's striking that uh, the that people of Kimolas are so um, didn't use any product of the sea. It's it's difficult to imagine that they were um, voyaging down south, uh, and this strengthens what Solange uh, just told. Uh, it's, uh, we can imagine that some really coastal people did existed uh, and, and that the sites uh, are now underwater. Uh, this is a, an hypothesis that has been uh, mentioned by uh, Jan Bess a long time ago, but which is uh, really interesting and which is difficult to, to demonstrate, of course, or to question, but um, I think that we have to be here again, uh, very cautious with, uh, the small part, the small parcel of, uh, of information that we have uh, about these people. The rejection of, of, 
of any marine uh, food is something troubling, really. And in Cyprus, it's not the only fact of this kind. The, the, the disappearance of, of cattle and the absence of cattle in the site during so many millennia after uh, Shiro Kambos and, uh, and I see of this uh, where cattle is still prison is something really uh, strange. I don't know if it is in Sula, I don't think so, but it's something can be strengthened because of um, restricted territory, not to say insular. Okay, Alan, is last question or comments, let's say. Okay, yes, yeah, so I have to let my pet hippo out of the, the house soon. Um, actually, this has been a very, very uh, stimulating con uh, discussion, and I, I would just like to reiterate, it must have been an amazing place to be, because we know these people did not come from one place. Imagine the different languages that were perhaps being spoken on this, on this small island, and... Um, I, I think uh, it just must, if we had a time machine, it would be an incredible uh, place to see the interactions here. And um, I'm sure as more people are doing more work, we're going to find more sites. And uh, just as a final point, one possible mainland um, recipient of uh, an artifact, and I wouldn't push this too far, is the pottery Neolithic incised cobbles that you find in your Mukian sites that you also find at Kirikatea uh, a thousand years earlier or so. I wouldn't push that too far, but they are remarkably similar. So um, let's hope that people will continue to be doing some more exciting research. Thanks.